Global Governance Futures is brought to you from the Global Governance Institute at University College London. This is a podcast about the challenges facing humanity and possible global responses. How does the world hang together? What has gone wrong? And what has global governance got to do with it? To learn more, please visit ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance. This great conversation with Richard was filmed early on in the pandemic and as such our technical process wasn't up to scratch. There were some email blips that you might be able to hear and some background noise but we hope that it doesn't distract from the overall conversation. It's a real pleasure to introduce our guest on this episode of Global Governance Futures, Professor Richard Folk. Professor Folk is a world-renowned authority on international law, global politics and ethics. He taught at Princeton University Politics Department for over 40 years and has published upwards of 50 books and many articles on international law. Over a long and distinguished career, beginning in the late 1950s, Professor Folk has been a prominent and outspoken critic of the Westphalian system of nation states and what he views as a status quo geopolitics, which is permissive, if not complicit, in the face of gross injustice. In a recent piece titled Twilight of the Nation State at a Time of Resurgent Nationalism, he restates his conviction that, quote, no adequate political mechanism is available to protect the global or human interest as distinct from the national interest or its aggregation. Professor Falk was chair of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation's Board of Directors until 2012 and has served as Honorary Vice President of the American Society of International Law. In 2008, he was appointed UN Special Rapporteur on Palestinian Human Rights by the UN Human Rights Council, where he served until 2014. Well known as an activist scholar, Professor Falk decided early on in his career that he had an ethical duty to combine academic work with political activism in a role he describes as the citizen pilgrim. Indeed, his most recent book, published just last week, is titled Public Intellectual, The Life of a Citizen Pilgrim and recounts his extraordinary journey through the momentous twists and turns of the past half century. For my part, as an international relations scholar who is grappling with what an age of planetary crisis might mean for this discipline, it's been fascinating to find that this kind of debate is actually nothing new. Indeed, the 1960s and 1970s was a time of very lively discussion on questions of world order in the context of ecological crisis. And I've been left wondering what value we might find in excavating from these earlier, now forgotten debates. And this is really a rare opportunity to speak with one of its key protagonists. So I'd love to nerd out a little bit, Richard, and ask you to cast your mind back to those days. So by the late 1960s, you were already directing your attention towards what you described in a letter to the famous political theorist, Harold Laswell, the ecological, demographic, and biogenetic aspects of the future of world order. Uh, I was wondering what prompted this intellectual shift at a time when the war and peace, cold war, bipolar paradigm was so dominant in the discipline? Well, it was a uh, momentous uh, change of direction for me, not so much from uh, thinking cold war, bipolar, axis of concern, but it was a departure from my involvement with the opposition to the Vietnam War, which was a very preoccupying issue in the United States uh, throughout the 1960s and really was a, a transformative moment for myself when, because I, it led me away from being a library classroom academician to to be an engaged citizen at the same time. And and I was very influenced by uh, a trip I made in the middle of uh, the Vietnam War to North Vietnam 
where I witnessed the effects of a high technology uh, war being waged against a low technology society and how the Vietnamese people, uh, which were, I found very impressive from a cultural and social point of view, were completely vulnerable and victimized an uh, enemy who was uh, projecting its military power at such great distances. Let me now get to your question, which is uh, really a, um, uh, was a kind of capricious uh, change in my own research agenda. I was spending a year of leave from Princeton at the Stanford Center for the Advanced Study of the Behavioral Sciences. And in the very early days I was there, uh, I went to get a drink at the corridor water cooler and had a long conversation with a physicist at Stanford who uh, persuaded me uh, to drop what I was working on, which was to bring together my writing on Vietnam and uh, address this planetary crisis that he convinced me was emerging. And the more I looked into it, the more convinced I became right. And so I really uh, altered my uh, projected research and had a kind of accidental reinforcement of that because the cultural editor of the New York Times came to write a feature story on the uh, activities of this research center in the middle of Stanford University and uh, ended up this, uh, he interviewed several people there and including myself and ended up devoting his column in the New York Times to my, re my proposed research. And that generated a lot of interest that unprecedented before or ever since in uh, the manuscript that I hadn't started writing yet. 22 publishers got in touch with me and it was quite a uh, overwhelming experience, but it certainly led me uh, to try to uh, work out my thinking about these issues. And I produced a book called This Endangered Planet, which was published in 1972 by Random House, one of the mainstream publishers that academic people like myself don't often get published by. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I then um, sort of um, dropped the issue and it had very, it was only um, tangentially uh, connected with uh, the WAMP uh, project. Because the WAMP project was funded and conceived by uh, Saul Mendlevitz and uh, the funders were not, he wasn't the funder, but his friends who were uh, Wall Street uh, entrepreneurs uh, provided the funding and they uh, held a kind of world federalist, world government outlook that emerged out of, really out of World War II. There was this sense that we, world could not afford a third world war and that uh, world government was the answer and the shape of that world government was prefigured in the u.s constitution so it was very much uh, a kind of export global uh, an attempt to globalize uh, american uh, market-oriented constitutionalism and uh, this was not what um, ended up being the actual WAMP project because it's one of these instances where the, uh, the person that really uh, imagined the project thought of it as world government advocacy. But it turned out that he was the only one that shared that outlook among the research scholars like myself that participated. And what its, what its real value turned out to be 
was the way people from different civilizational and ideological backgrounds uh, understood what the planetary crisis was and what to do about it. And it, it uh, illustrated the very sharp division between those of us in the North who were worried about war and war prevention and those in the global South who were preoccupied with post-independence uh, uh, state building and development. And economic development and domestic state building were really the priorities. And they just wanted to stay out of this geopolitical conflict that was so uh, preoccupying for those of us in uh, Europe, North America, and uh, Soviet Union. So it, it was, and, and the books that came out of the WAMP project, uh, none of them are, uh, one would say, uh, could be considered as a, uh, as proposing that the solution of the planetary crises uh, was, could be achieved by uh, a world government in the American model. Mine probably came close, uh, my, my book from the project called The Study of Future Worlds probably came closest, uh, but I very carefully avoided the rhetoric of world government and talked about central guidance system and uh, used a different kind of language to say there was a need for more uh, for more uh, globalized uh, problem solving mechanisms but that there was no political traction behind the idea of world government and given the economic uh, inequalities that existed in the world, uh, it would have been a likely disaster to have attempted to uh, combine such on such diverse uh, political uh, communities into a single uh, confederated whole, and probably would have led to some form of uh, either chaos or tyranny and and uh, would not be a very uh, constructive response to the issues that were at the surface back then 50 years ago. You've raised a lot of really important and fascinating issues that we could explore. I suppose one thing I'd like to ask is so what is, well, I mean, I think it would be a surprise to many people to learn how sophisticated the, the academic discussion was around the possibility of a global federated form of social organization during that time. Uh, I don't think that many scholars today and certainly many students really have much knowledge of those earlier debates. Um, and I'd be curious to ask to what extent that also reflected kind of a, uh, a desire to bring in a more global South developing country perspective. I, mean, I have found a quote from the former famous Indian Prime Minister um, Nehru, who was no utopian. Uh, and he essentially argued in the mid 1950s that uh, the only way to look ahead assuredly is for some kind of world order, one world to emerge. Um, and I, I'm wondering to what extent that sort of rhetoric reflected sort of geopolitical strategic positioning or to what extent that reflected a, 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 a real sense that this could be a pragmatic possibility. Your response, your earlier response seems to suggest perhaps the former more than the latter. Um. It's, it's probably hard to say and different people probably had uh, different ways of configuring a, a response. I think there was the further you got from World War, the end of World War II, the less uh, was invested by 
at least elite figures in the idea that there needed to be a fundamental change in the way in which the world was organized. Um, in, the, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, there was this sense uh, that it was too dangerous to persist as a world order. And uh, the world government rhetoric seemed to be the most uh, uh, accessible uh, rhetoric uh, in order to address that challenge. But as the Cold War uh, paradigm began to be dominant, it seemed uh, just implausible to think that you could get enough agreement among the leading states uh, to shape any kind of global order that was more centralized. And the, the notions of bipolarity uh, uh, took precedence in the mainstream. So uh, efforts like the WAMP project really were reactions to this uh, kind of drift away from the sort of sentiments that individuals like Nehru or Bertrand Russell and others had had uh, after World War II, Einstein and, and Buckminster Fuller, the sort of geo, uh, the inventor of the geodesic dome and a kind of visionary uh, architect had this phrase, utopia or else, you know, in, a, in effect say, suggesting that uh, what realists thought feasible was a path to dystopia, to a dystopian future. And, and so there was this um, underlying sense that something fundamental had to be changed, but that was really at the edges of the uh, debate, which again uh, conformed to the realist uh, pattern uh, typified by individuals like George Kennan, uh, Morgan Thaw, uh, and uh, others who came later, like uh, Brzezinski, uh, uh, many, many, many other, uh, Raymond Aron in France. And, uh, and, and the Soviets had a similar way of seeing the world that was not very dissimilar from what, how the West saw international relations. <clears throat> and, and in this, um, again, I think it's, it's worth thinking in this dualistic way about the uh, world order discourse at this period, because most people think of it as East-West dominated by the ideological difference between Marxism and capitalism. But there was also this uh, north-south discourse, uh, and and that really was between uh, the uh, notion of a new international economic order based on uh, greater equality between the technologically advanced countries and the rest of the world, and a uh, more uh, uh, organizational effort, including at the UN, to uh, mobilize energy and resources for development, for the development of, of the poorer countries. Yes, I think it's very interesting to go back to look at some of that scholarship around the the, the WAMP project, the, the World Order Models project and also to perhaps reflect a little bit on what conclusions that you and uh, colleagues drew from those experiments and those thought exercises at that time and their legacies to to this day well i think the greatest surprise for the organizers was the disinterest in western thought about uh, 
these kind of concerns. And uh, I think it perhaps uh, was exaggerated by this being a post-colonial moment when the colonial era of deferring to the West had ended and uh, there was a kind of almost um, uh, ideological rejection of any idea that, c that could be as closely associated uh, with the West. And, and I think the WAMP brought together very strong personalities from these uh, various civilizational backgrounds. Uh, including Latin America, India, China, Japan, Soviet Union, and uh, the strong G uh, German participant, and uh, um, Johann Galtung, who was sort of non-territorial uh, participant, myself. Uh, and we interacted quite, we were quite uh, congenial uh, group, uh, except for the organizer and the convener who continued to press his agenda, uh, and, uh, which was resisted quite vigorously by the rest of us. And, uh, the value of the project was both this friction that, uh, showed uh, those who participated, uh, that the U.S. was not in a position to dictate the future of the world, you know, the future of the world, that uh, geopolitical and military, uh, geopolitical hegemony and military capabilities could not easily be translated into political outcomes. And in my own learning experience, that was the, that remains the central unlearned lesson of the Vietnam War, that you can have total military superiority and yet lose the war. And understanding that puzzle uh, and reacting and adapting to it uh, has uh, been a, a, a systemic failure of policy planners in including the US, including in my view Israel and some other countries that are involved in conflict situations. In other words, there's a new realism in the post-colonial world in which political outcomes are more determined by the perseverance of nationalist movements than they are by who is the better military hardware. That doesn't mean that the military hardware can't uh, cause massive suffering and devastation, but it does mean that it won't win the war. And finally, the intervening side gets tired of the losses without achieving the results and gets out, withdraws. And, but you see the unlearned, this, what I'm calling the unlearned lesson of the Vietnam War repeated in Afghanistan and in Iraq and Libya. And what it uh, has led to are these so-called forever wars, wars that uh, go on and on and really don't change uh, the internal or regional uh, picture very much. It reminds me a bit of the old adage, you know, if, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to hand, I know Jess has a question, so please, Jess. Yeah, continuing on this vein of thought about um, a world of sovereign states that's unable to cope with endangered planet problems. And I'm quoting you here in the early 70s saying that the political logic of nationalism generates a system of international relations that is dominated by conflict and competition. So my question is, um, why have such observations and above all the issue of climate change so rarely been examined seriously within the mainstream of IR inquiry? And why 50 years later have we not progressed further into this vein of thought in addressing key issues facing the world today? Um. Well, yes, that's a, 
important, complicated uh, question. Um, and I think the uh, clearest uh, answer is that the system itself is invested in military solutions. And therefore, it has a very difficult time uh, taking into account uh, the possibility of non-military uh, solutions. Um, and uh, part of it, this is the need to sustain a wartime budget in the absence of real strategic threats. And you can only do that by exaggerating the conflictual nature of uh, developments around the world and uh, po uh, presenting them as uh, dangerously uh, poised to uh, threaten fundamental security. And uh, this this really uh, combines the uh, organization of the world into distinct territorial states with the excessive militarization of those that those among these territorial states that are geopolitical actors. And I draw this distinction within the Westphalian framework between the so sovereign states and the few states among them that are geopolitical actors, such as at the present time, the United States, China, and maybe Russia, and to some extent, the UK and France. In other words, the the permanent members of the UN Security Council that enjoy uh, impunity in relation to international criminal law, they they have a veto power over the Security Council decisions, which means essentially that they only have to obey uh, the UN Charter and international law when it serves their national interests. So you have this very strange constitutional arrangement in the world uh, that is embodied in the UN system where the smaller states are accountable and the weak, the, I mean, the weaker states are accountable and the stronger states are operating according to their own discretion. They, so, and they're the most dangerous. The most dangerous states are not governed by, not, ex, not even technically not governed by an obligation to uphold international law. So you have double standards throughout the system. And that means that you can uh, overcome uh, these biases that privilege those national uh, communities that have geopolitical courage. So that includes not only the United States, but the states that are closely aligned with it. it and the same thing for the other kind of uh, states. And it affects, it goes back to World War II where at the end of the war, only the defeated uh, German and Japanese leaders were held accountable and the victors were given impunity. So you have double standards built into the essence of uh, international law. And that is despite the fact that um, despite the fact that one of the worst uh, uh, and most controversial uh, legacies of World War II was the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, 
that was never examined except in a Japanese uh, lower court uh, from an international law point of view. And yet, if the Germans or Japanese had developed the atomic bomb and then used it, and then went on to lose the war, there's little doubt that that would have been criminalized. And the whole attitude toward nuclear weaponry uh, would have emerged in a very different manner. I'm not sure how successfully I answered your question. So uh, ask me a follow-up. Uh, very successfully. Thank you. Um, I do have a follow-up. In terms of the rigidity of and the Western bias within the UN Security Council and the um, sort of tendency to favor these uh, Western states and the power that they hold. How do you think that's contributed to the rhetoric of globalization and the global North-South uh, divide uh, over the last 30 years through the structural readjustment programs and where we are right now in terms of global polarization of uh, resources and um, ideologies? Uh, yes, I think there's no, no question that it has... Uh, been a contributing factor. Of course, it's been offset to some extent by the Asian resurgence, because the uh, even though China is a um, member of the P5, until very recently, it didn't have much geopolitical leverage, and it didn't play a really important part at the global level. Now, in the last few years it has, but the uh, emergence of China uh, in the face of this Western dominated economic system is quite extraordinary because they took advantage of uh, certain features of um, state socialism as it was uh, badly practiced in the Soviet Union and he combined it with good features of the market uh, organization of the economy to achieve the greatest surge in economic development in all of history. You know, it was at China at the end of World War II and even quite a bit later was viewed as a hopelessly overpopulated, um, under-industrialized, um, basket case of the international uh, of international society, and this incredible turnaround uh, started in the about uh, fifty years ago, half century ago, under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping and the so-called modernization movement in China. Uh, really, was a revolutionary transformation. Uh, that didn't really uh, uh, depend very heavily on uh, Western ideas or Western technology. Rather, it uh, took advantage of certain needs of the Western economies to provide uh, very attractive investment opportunities that accelerated its development um, speed. And other countries in Asia also did extremely well, even though they didn't adhere to the um, kind of Chinese uh, model of um, what they called uh, a market system with socialist characteristics. But China, more than more than the rest, uh, in one generation, eliminated extreme poverty for 300 million people, uh, which is uh, an amazing achievement. And Vietnam has now more recently done the same thing, following really the Chinese uh, model, more or less. And there's a book by uh, Deepak Nair, uh, published by Oxford University Press called Asian Resurgence, 
which ha is a, he's an economist, uh, it's a kind of economistic account, but he follows the trajectory of 14 countries in Asia and shows that it doesn't matter very much whether they are categorized as um, socialist or capitalist. What matters is how they handle state society relations and particularly with regard to savings and investment. And um, some of the other, all of these Asian countries did well in this uh, period, which suggests that there's a cultural foundation uh, connected as much with Confucian ethics as it is with um, uh, Marxist and Maoist thinking. Uh, so the uh, the whole uh, question of how far Western hegemony extends beyond its uh, dominance of military technology is very difficult to uh, I think crystallize at this point. I mean the 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 insurgence of. Asia is, is an extraordinary transformation of geopolitics and I do sometimes wonder what it must have been like to, to do geopolitics, to teach geopolitics in the 1970s. I presume China would not have featured very much in those conversations, whereas obviously today... Mm, yeah. So I'd like to hand over to Sam. Sam's got a question for you. Good. Hi Richard, thank you. Yeah, just... A question on we talked about the kind of inherent geopolitical nature of the UN system, and obviously your work within the UN uh, provides a kind of unique vantage point for analysing that system. Um, I was wondering if you had any takeaways about potential ways through that kind of geopolitical gridlock, and then just as a, a side question, you can choose either one or, or merge the two. Truth to power has been a kind of key. Um, key tool used in you know post-colonial uh, discourse and also now uh, when thinking about big systems and I was wondering if you could talk about how useful that is as a, a tool today when thinking about the kind of inherent geopolitical nature of the UN system and whether it's still a valid means of, of, of change making. Um, uh, yes, that's a, a uh, really uh, fundamental question. Uh, the, my own uh, personal involvement was uh, with the uh, UN Human Rights Council, which is uh, not a decision-making body on these geopolitical questions. And uh, uh, even though uh, I was required to report to the General Assembly uh, each year during the six years that I had this uh, position, I didn't uh, get a great deal of under additional understanding of how the UN system worked. What I did do overall, and particularly because of my uh, assigned role as a special rapporteur for Israel-Palestine, was the sense that the UN was very important on the level of symbolic politics, but very limited on the level of substantive politics. In other words, it could serve to legitimate or delegitimate behavior, but it couldn't implement the results of its uh, determination. Uh, it, because it was subject to uh, geopolitical blockage. In other words, the, U, the U.S. and the other uh, G5 uh, members had a lot of leverage outside the Security Council, but they couldn't block fact-finding and um, uh, report, uh, investigative reports and other kinds of assessments, particularly in the secondary uh, parts of the UN system, like the UN uh, Human Rights Council or uh, UNESCO or the Economic and Social Council. Um, 
But what they could do is block the implementation of any recommendations that came out of those uh, initiatives. And so, uh, again, going back to what I said earlier about the puzzle that uh, military capabilities have lost agency in relation to the political outcome of conflict. It turns out that winning legitimacy wars, the phrase I uh, developed, is often more important than winning on the battlefield. And so the, and the UN is a definite, uh, uh, important site of struggle in these legitimacy wars. And that's why, for instance, uh, Israel cares care so much about being criticized by the UN or uh, investigated by the International Criminal Court. And it's why um, the anti-apartheid campaign was so important in bringing the apartheid regime in South Africa to its knees. It wasn't through uh, violent resistance that changed the balance of forces. It was this change on the level of symbolic politics. And that's why I think people make the mistake either of thinking uh, the UN is the savior of a just world order or just dismissing it as irrelevant. You find, find both points of view, either a very legalistic point of view uh, that says that all we need to do to create a peaceful and just world is to uphold the Charter, or the opposite view that says, since the Charter isn't being upheld, the UN is irrelevant. So I've tried to articulate this uh, middle ground of, well, not middle ground exactly, but this understanding of what the UN can and can't do and why what it can do is important, but that from the point of view of people enduring a very uh, bad situation, it's extremely difficult to modify behavior if it has the, if the status quo has the support of the geopolitical actors. Sometimes the UN can do too much. You can argue that it's support for the Libyan intervention in 2011 because it had geopolitical backing was an excessive use of force that had produced a deterioration in the situation within Libya. Uh, it became a regime changing intervention that, that uh, destabilized the country it did eliminate uh, Gaddafi, the authoritarian ruler, but it replaced that with a ongoing civil strife and chaos. And that's happened often in the aftermath of these uh, interventions, sometimes advertised as humanitarian interventions. That it's extremely difficult in the post-colonial age to use military power to alter the internal balance of forces within uh, sovereign states. Yeah, the importance of symbolic power is something that perhaps gets under uh, is underappreciated in uh, in the in the the kind of the, the paradigmatic understanding of of where power resides within these systems. Um, yeah. So, Sam, do you have a follow-up? Yeah. So, thanks, Richard. It's a, a great perspective, and it, it actually reminds me of a previous episode. Um, I guess we had Fahana Yamin, who talked about her work in the UN and what it can and what it cannot do for, in her case, climate change. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the working on different levels. You know, that uh, we talked about what the UN can do and the agency that it can be afforded, but then on the more immediate struggles, you know, for example, your, your work in Palestine, that it might need something a little more immediate, a little more grassroots 
And I was wondering how your citizen pilgrim idea might play into that, um, as, as obviously we're students going out into the world, um, and how we might be able to maybe continue that, that kind of ethos, that idea. Yes, I think that that's um, very relevant. Um, the, the government structure, even putting aside for the moment uh, the problem of geopolitics, is one that is geared toward incremental change. And the problems uh, that are emerging, uh, <clears throat> not only climate change and biodiversity, but also uh, global migration to some extent, uh, nuclear weaponry, these are problems that call for systemic responses. And systemic responses can only, I think, only arise out of in two contexts. One is uh, a world order catastrophe, especially a war, which creates more uh, flexibility with regard to uh, adapting the system, or as a result of in a combination of uh, governmental initiative, but strong grassroots civil society pressure. And, uh, for instance, the anti-apartheid campaign is a good illustration where the, uh, UN was led to, uh, support, uh, the anti-apartheid movement, but only after a very extensive, uh, grassroots uh, mobilization took place, particularly in the UK and the US, and overcame the objections of very conservative Cold War oriented governments at that time, uh, Reagan in the US and Thatcher in uh, Britain. They were forced from below uh, to uh, give way uh, to these uh, pressures that were basically of a ethical and political character, uh, but had uh, very widespread uh, support. Uh, and so I think climate change itself is something that illustrates this mismatch between uh, a governmental reluctance to make uh, systemic adjustments and the nature of the problem and the challenge, which requires systemic adjustment. In some ways, uh, the young Swedish woman, uh, Greta Thunberg, I thought well summarized this in her talk at the UN where, uh, where her most uh, vivid takeaway line was uh, to the de delegates whom she was addressing, uh, you will die of old age, we will die of climate change. And, and I think that is suggestive not only of grassroots, but of the uh, importance of young people being, uh, uh, considering themselves uh, participants in the struggle for a viable future. And um, that that uh, consciousness, that political consciousness, is um, probably more vital in the present time than ever before. If governments are not; uh, they are too subject to conflicting interests to be capable of taking. Uh, clear systemic positions except in uh, circumstances of catastrophe or of a uh, powerful movement, popular movement. I'm reminded a bit of um, Gramsci's notion of the interregnum. Yeah. You know, the old order is dying, the new is not, not yet born, and in the interregnum arise 
the morbid symptoms, perhaps that's where we are at the moment. So I, I'm aware of the time, Richard. I, um, I do want to hand over to Zoe. Zoe has a question. Good. Um, kind of following on from that, I my question is, what advice do you have for millennials or Generation Z trying to make sense of the drivers of systems or systems change at the macro global scale in 2021 and where they might fit in when it comes to ensuring our governance systems defer to planetary needs? Well, I think that's more a question for me to put to you than for you to put to me. Um, but uh, I mean, the essence of what I was trying to say in response to the earlier question is that it's a, a imperative call for activism, that, that the one thing that your generation cannot do is leave it to the older generations to solve the problems that confront your society, your life, your future, and that uh, this could also have the additional benefit of revitalizing our understanding of citizenship in a democratic society that it's more than elections and it's uh, it, it could be a more movement oriented understanding of citizenship which uh, creates new um, opportunities for uh, policy making to be um, more creative less shaped by special interests and more transnational and the nature of these uh, uh, nature of the policy agenda at the present time is uh, caught between this uh, persisting organization of political community in terms of national uh, territorial states and the character of global the global problematic which affects uh, certainly regions but in many cases humanity as a whole so it, it really uh, encourages the development of a more um, complex notion of uh, personal identity that you may be British, but you're also um, European and you're also part of humanity and that all of those are relevant. You don't have to choose uh, but among them. Uh, so I think that, that we older people look to you younger people to give us the creative direction to address the future. This way. Do you have a response possibly, Zoe? Uh, not really, just that, you know, I hope I hope our generation doesn't doesn't disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're rolling to a close, Richard. Thank you so much for your time. Perhaps just to end, uh, you know, you, you wrote <laughs> over 50 years ago that you regarded as virtually essential to bring into being more centralized forms of political authority in international life by the end of the 20th century. Uh, just curious to ask how you feel this claim holds up uh, some 60 years later. And I suppose you've given us some indication of what the direction of travel in that, in, in, towards that objective might look like in terms of reflecting much more deeply on a politics of identity within a, a uniquely globalized age. Uh, it, I think essentially, uh the way in which uh, particularly ecological issues have emerged uh, reinforces my sense that uh, if the human species is to flourish in the future, it has to figure out, it has to establish mechanisms capable of acting in the global interest and for the global public good, let's put it that way, uh, uh, and acting for humanity rather than acting for 
uh, particular states or particular uh, regions and civilizations that we need to, the whole has to become greater than the parts. Now, whether that means institutionalization or governmentality is perhaps uh, still uncertain. What, what form, how it should be embodied. But the idea of finding a way of uh, overcoming uh, the present uh, equation, which makes the parts dominate the whole. See, the parts are much greater than the whole in the, in the Westphalian uh, framework. Not only because of statism, but because of this geopolitical override that gives uh, a few states uh, this special kind of uh, role in shaping policy according to their particular national interest without uh, deference to international agreed international legal uh, standards. Uh, what the whole is, is uh, it's still to be determined, I think. And how that is to come into being, short of catastrophe, and short of a uh, movement that mobilizes people in a, a new, different kind of revolutionary spirit, is very hard to say. And as you suggested, by the Gramsci quote, uh, we're, we're likely to experience some morbid uh, moments in this transitional uh, time. And uh, speaking as an American, Trump and Trumpism were examples of uh, morbid uh, responses to the confronting humanity. Well, thank you so much for your time, Richard. I think we can at least all agree that it is a fascinating time to be alive. And in some respects, a kind of a, I guess, a kind of a call to adventure. Um, it was also very interesting to hear you talk about the whole of the parts and shade into complex, complex systems ideas, which we have been engaging a bit in previous conversations. And this idea that the, the whole is not just greater, but actually different to the sum of the parts. Uh, so perhaps something to, to ponder there as we move this conversation forward. But thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Good. I enjoyed being with you all and wish you well with this work. Hope it goes forward in a good Thank way. You. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to Imperfect Utopias or Bust, Global Governance Futures. If you liked this content, please do leave us a comment and subscribe. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favorite books, other resources, listen to past shows, and to join our community, go to ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance.